The opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. Hello and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. The world was struck by the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, and in 2020, states across our nation and countries across, across the globe instituted a range of policies called non-pharmaceutical interventions by epidemiologists, and more popularly called lockdowns. The illness caused by this new virus, COVID-19, has claimed an estimated 500,000 lives in the U.S. to date and millions worldwide. So the policy response may seem proportionate, if perhaps unprecedented. As we study and debate the emergency measures put in place to address the pandemic, an important question will be, what else might we have done if not locking down? Joining me on eConversations today to provide some historical and philosophical answers to this question is Mr. Jeffrey Tucker. He's the editorial director for the American Institute for Economic Research. Jeffrey is a writer, a blogger, and speaker who attended Howard Payne University and Texas Tech University as an undergraduate. Prior to going to AIER, he worked for the Mises Institute and the Foundation for Economic Education. He's the author of nine books and hundreds of articles, of frequently bringing a consistent, consistently libertarian and Austrian economic view to issues of the day. Uh, Mr. Tucker recently authored a new book called Liberty or Lockdown, and, and during the pandemic he's written extensively about the history of immunology and epidemiology. Welcome show, to the show, Jeff. So nice to be here. Thank you so much, Dan. So let, let's uh, start with this first question. You know, uh, People will want to know, because we know what policy response we took, was there an alternative? Was there something else that we could have done? In the past, what we did is we left disease mitigation to medical professionals. Uh, so if you get sick then uh, and you're not feeling well at all and you're worried about some severe outcome, you go to your doctor. And then the doctor uses therapeutics uh, to try to make you better. And that's how we always dealt with pandemics in the past. And so for some reason, this time we decided to do something completely different, which was to institute mandatory uh, forced separation between individuals and and forced masks for the first time in American history. They were limited use in 1918, but mostly during the uh, flu seasons in the past, 67, 68, 57, 58, uh, and all the way back to the polio epidemic, 40, 48, 52, uh, we treated medical problems with the medical solutions mm -hmm. <laughs> and not with political or bureaucratic ones. We've never had anything like this. So this is a real experiment uh, in history, nothing like this has ever been done before. And what's interesting is that, you know, it's it's a test. It's really, mm -hmm. it was a socioeconomic experiment to try to see if we can try a different way besides our, our old system of public health, which, which was not to disrupt society. We decided to try something that the New York Times called medieval. And uh, the results were a disaster, actually. And, you know, AIR has now uh, accumulated a list of 30 separate academic papers. Uh, studying uh, the effectiveness of lockdowns around the world. And uh, all of them say there's no relationship whatsoever between the trajectory of the virus uh, and the severe outcome associated with them and the degree of stringency of lockdowns. In other words, um, a virus is going to be a virus and it's going to have its effect and there's nothing politics can really do to, to change it. And even within the US, we see cases uh, you know, Georgia has been open since April. Uh, Florida is entirely open since September. And uh, as you know, uh, yesterday, Texas opened up everything. But in these, we have a natural experiment right here within the US, which is a very large country, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the states had different rules because mostly it was left to a kind of a, um, a lot of discretion on the part of the states. Some states resisted it entirely, like South Dakota. And you can compare the states that stayed open with those that stayed closed and see no significant relationship between uh, severe outcomes and the degree of stringency of the what you call MPIs, the so lockdowns. So uh, what that indicates is that uh, maybe uh, we're choosing a crazy method to attempt to do something that's basically impossible. And that's why I would say 
uh, 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 we've, we've done. So there's, there's two ways you have to you to get a test for anything. Uh, the first thing is to establish a significant relationship between two variables, right? right? And then after that, you have to struggle to infer causality between the mm -hmm. two because you don't want to commit a post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy or just uh, identifying a mere correlations as causations. In the case of lockdowns and disease mitigation, you can't even get to the first step. Mm -hmm. There's no statistically significant relationship at all between uh, lockdown policies and uh, uh, disease mitigation, like at all. And th this is gravely embarrassing to the people who concocted these, these, these policies because their experiment essentially completely flopped. And now we're in a strange situation where uh, they're going to have to admit it uh, and, and be, because there's, there's no science to, to back any of it. And every time that somebody claims there's science to back any of it, uh, you, you can go in and look at the study and show that it's not true, you know? So this is a serious problem, and especially when you consider the cost of the lockdowns. I mean, the, right. we can start the list, but oh my God, it's, it's, we've never done anything, we've never experienced anything like this. A social, psychological, cultural, economic crisis like we hoped we always to avoid, it's now upon us. Well, if you if you would, because you, you've written a lot during the, the pandemic about some of the, the history of, of, of epidemiology and the, the idea of non-pharmaceutical interventions. We're certainly around, at least amongst some epidemiologists, and we're entering into some pre, uh, government planning documents before 2020. So in one sense, it didn't like come completely out of left field. There, there were some people who were advocating this, but it's certainly not like uh, all epidemiologists were uh, so tell us a little bit about the, where, where this has sort of come from. Yeah, you're right about that. So about 20 years ago, uh, I think uh, almost uh, to the year, um, uh, disease uh, epidemiologists began to experiment with disease modeling mm -hmm. and to try to map out a virus trajectory and, and uh, build into the model certain assumptions about the R0, about the, uh, the, about the uh, pathogenicity of, of particular viruses, looking at the past ones and the future, uh, examining mobility patterns and all these things. And if you, 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 know, if you get like 40 assumptions or something in the model, you press the button, you can watch the virus uh, spread. And then you can try to introduce factors that might mitigate its spread. So you press those buttons, press those buttons. The, the problem is that like with all computer models, people began to believe them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. It's like, right. if, you, if you've ever known a person who's like a gamer, you know, mm -hmm. all they do is play World of Warcraft, and the whole world looks like World of Warcraft to them. It's, it's you know, it can get big. So it's the same thing with these disease modelers. And uh, Sinatra Gupta, at the time, the world's greatest epidemiologist, said, you know, this is a dangerous path. If you think you can model a virus, you're, you're playing a dangerous game. It, it, the computer gives you an illusory sense of control mm -hmm. that you will mm -hmm. never have in real life. So she warned very strongly against it. Well, five years later, um, this would have been about 2005, late 2005, uh, George Bush um, began to be concerned about bioterrorism mm -hmm. uh, as a blowback for the Iraq war and p put together a White House conference. And at this conference, invited, invited many people to present their own outlook on, on how to control a virus when it arrives, the pathogen. So most of the presenters of that event were regular old-fashioned uh, doctors, uh, people like uh, Donald Henderson, I think um, we can talk more about him, and, and just regular experts in public health who said always the same thing. Don't disrupt society. Uh, figure out who the vulnerable people are. It can be of any age group, any uh, amount of comorbidities, could be anything. If every virus is slightly different. Figure out who they are just by, by watching uh, the pathway of, of severe outcomes, I think, isolate that, t uh, recommend that population isolate itself for a time, and then the non-vulnerable people will uh, go about their business, and they'll ex experience exposure and and probably some discomfort associated with uh, uh, all you know sickness and life kind of they're all play together and and will eventually re achieve herd immunity. So this is the presentation of the regular public health officials. Um, uh, but there's a tiny minority of, of, of presenters there 
who started uh, deploying these these modeling scenarios, and they 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 arrived with very fancy um, uh, PowerPoint presentations and and models and graphs, mm -hmm. and 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 sure enough, gave the president of the United States the uh, 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 sense that he could control the pathogen. At the same time, Bill Gates was getting interested in the subject, and so began to fund all these epidemiology departments. Well, anyway, after that event, the White House basically sided with the modelers over the doctors, and wrote in the CDC's planning, uh, starting in 2006, uh, certain quarantine powers and playing with, around with the idea of limiting uh, gatherings and shutting down schools and a few other things. I mean, I knew about this at the time. I never actually believed they would use those powers, but they definitely claimed to have them. The White mm -hmm. House was okay with them having them. Um, and uh, uh, and so, but then with Gates's money and with um, uh, you know, change conditions and er ever rising intellectual arrogance on the part of a, uh, this minority of, of modeling communities, eventually they began to predominate the profession dominate the departments, take over the journals, and so on. They were just waiting for their opportunity to try out their great new experiment. 2009 came and went. They weren't able to do it. And then uh, 2012 and 2013 with SARS-CoV-1, it never quite reached the U.S., so they weren't able to try mm -hmm. it on us, but there were some efforts you know, in Taiwan and, and uh, China to kind of use limited uh, uh, targeted layered containment measures and things like this. But then that, that uh, event passed uh, also. It, so we had to wait all the way until uh, 2020 before they saw their opportunity. And they just, they basically what happened was that they made a mistake. They had it in their minds that this was going to be SARS-CoV-1, which is a, a very deadly right. uh, disease. Um, but that didn't happen. So they, what they did is they deployed their most extreme lockdown scenarios for what turned out to be a very widespread and mostly uh, mild uh, virus, except for the very old and very sick. Now, uh, just in terms of some of the alternatives, uh, the AI, AIER, the, the group that you uh, work with now, uh, put mm -hmm. forth, uh, I think back in September, uh, something called the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, put, uh, tell us a, a little bit about that, if you would, because that offered, mm -hmm. uh, I think, a a very alternative, a very distinct path forward that we could have mm -hmm. undertaken in this case. Well, this is born of frustration on the part of three really high-end experts, Sunetta Gupta from the UK, uh, Martin Kuldor from, from Harvard, who's actually got his training um, in Sweden, mm -hmm. and then Jay Bhattacharya, who you'll be interested to know has both a, an MD and a PhD in economics. Right. So, very interesting guy. But they they decided to come together and risk everything for because they they're morally courageous people and they saw what was happening they knew it was going to lead to teen suicides drug and overdoses and substance abuse and, and demoralization of the population you know reduced cancer reduced cancer screenings and and all the bad outcomes that we've seen and they thought they needed to do something to stop it. So they gathered here with us in, it was in, it was in October, it was early October, and they put together a very clean, clear, short statement um, about cell biology and public health. Uh, here's how viruses work. Here's how public health deals with viruses and all other potential uh, right. things that impact public health. And here's an alternative. Um, uh, let society function, let people go about their normal life routines, but because we know a lot about this virus, uh, we recommend to people who are the vulnerable people, uh, usually over 70 with co comorbidities is where you start entering into that vulnerable uh, category, although it can sometimes happen much much earlier, but, right. um, and, and, and recommend they uh, you know, protect themselves from the virus if they show, so choose, until we reach, reach herd immunity. Mm -hmm. Herd immunity is the point at which uh, the virus can no longer find a, uh, a host because there's been enough immunities developed within the population that everybody fights it off, and it becomes what epidemiologists called uh, an endemic equilibrium, which is to say that it's now manageable and predictable. So it, the virus never goes away. No virus ever goes completely away. 
right. um, not even smallpox, right? So uh, that's that's there's still a few instances of smallpox preserved, even though it's the only one we've actually technically eradicated. But most of the virus is still with us, but our immune system scale and adapt to the to the reality of, of these pathogens, and we're able to fight them off. That's that's the way the immune system is built. So they're recommending that we use natural meters and. Um, there wasn't a vaccine at the time, but they also hoped for a vaccine. And I think all three of them, um, again, they don't favor mandatory vaccines, but they're you know they're happy that we've right. got the vaccines and and glad for people to take them. But there was no sense of the Great Barrington Declaration. We had to wait until the vaccine. We have intelligent methods for dealing with disease medication that we've uh, used in the past, and and they were certain that it would work this time. Well. The result was, was of course, international hysteria. I mean, it became the central debating point, yeah, really, between the you know, first week of October and all the way up to now. This is right. this is the main, uh, uh, considered to be the main alternative. In the meantime, we've had a lot of scholarship about about their plan called uh, Focus Protection with a lot of practical solutions for how we can deal with this um, uh, protecting the vulnerable next time it around. And in particular, I mean, I think with uh, COVID-19, I mean, this virus does happen to have such a, a elevated, a, a small group of people who are highly vulnerable to it, and many people not not very vulnerable at all. I mean, and that's different. I mean, I guess if the, the next time a new virus comes along, it might be a different story. I mean, certainly uh, back yeah. in the, the Spanish influenza in 1918, people in their 20s and 30s were very vulnerable to that. So you, you do have to take the, the different uh, patterns, I think, of, of vulnerability and, and what, what we can learn about the virus in, into account. Mm -hmm. Now, Yeah, you're right about that. If, if you could have chosen one uh, pandemic pathogen over the last 100 years uh, that would have been the most amenable to an intelligent management, it would have been uh, SARS-CoV-2 because, because they... We the almost the risk for for healthy people under the age of 50 is is negligible. For under under 30, it approaches zero. Uh, you know, there's always going to be outlying cases, but this one was really beautifully constructed to protect the vulnerable people mm -hmm. and let the rest of society go about its business. I mean, that the schools never should have shut down. We we know this now, and I think everybody agrees with this now. But once they shut down schools, then they had to shut down businesses. Once they shut down businesses, then, then they had to shut down parks and movie theaters and public events. It was a, it was a, it was a, a catastrophe. Really, the, the really the virus was was political pandemonium and panic. Yeah, uh, you you mentioned the the name Donald Henderson, and, and then there is a, another Donald. I think that's uh, figured pretty prominently into how we respond. A, a gentleman named Donald McNeil, who I guess up until recently was r r writing for the New York Times, and and uh, they offered a you know, really very different uh, path forward that we could have taken in, in this case. And unfortunately, uh, uh, Donald uh, McNeil's strategy or a suggestion that we go medieval uh, against the, the virus uh, was the one that politicians all too often uh, uh, adopted. But and yeah. uh, just the whole idea that we were going to take these uh, for MPI measures and, and that we were going to go medieval on it I mean, how is it that, that we ended up thinking that like the, the MPIs in, in, in our lockdown policies were somehow the, the scientific uh, approach to that? Because it really was more back to the, 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 the old medieval way that we dealt with things before we knew very much about them. Yeah, um, McNeil is an, is an odd character. He has no medical uh, training or background at, at all. He actually has a, a degree in rhetoric from, from Berkeley and uh, he's reported about you know pandemics around the world. I think I think he's pretty pretty darn knowledgeable guy, but it's it's his beat. And, and you know I, th I think what happened was that when this when this pathogen came along, the New York Times decided to feature him as their expert. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend Michael Barbaro, who runs the New York Times Daily podcast, I've asked him several times to just fess up. Do you, when when Donald McNeil got on the air on February twenty seventh. Uh, did he know that Donald was going to predict 4.4 uh, million American dead? Uh, did he know that he was going to be, you know, planning to just spread panic and to, to, to predict a 3% uh, uh, death rate, you know, to, to, to advocate that everybody uh, be, be forced to stay in, in their homes and, uh, and not be able to travel and shut down schools and so on. 
Did 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 Michael Barbaro know that Donald McNeil was going to say that? I don't know. I've listened to the transcript so many times over, and I can't tell. Either Michael is a very good actor, or Michael is shocked. I just don't. I don't entirely know. And I think you know. I, it's, it's very interesting uh, because I know these epidemiologists that favor lockdowns. By the way, none of them have ever managed a pandemic before, right? This is all mm. like a new business for these people. Um, but they've been around for a number of years, and there's no necessary reason why they would have prevailed. I think, I think that the the critical element here was was that was the spreading of public panic through the media, and then then the politicians sensed that the panic was out there, and they felt like they had to do something. Or else right. people will get mad at them and get blamed for death, basically, is what, mm-hmm. uh, what happened. And I think Donald McNeil had a lot to do with that. The very next day, uh, the 28th, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times called, To Deal with the Coronavirus, We Need to Go Medieval. And he said, it's, the article starts very uh, sensibly. It said, you know, a public health wisdom is that we uh, let the virus circulate and, uh, and develop immunities to it while protecting the people who are vulnerable to it, but don't disrupt society and keep, keep people calm and encourage people to see the doctors and that sort of thing. And that's the modern way. He said, then there's the medieval way, yeah. which is to c- quarantine uh, p- people, lock people in their homes and their disease-ridden homes. He said something like crazy stuff. Block all travel and use brutal methods to suppress the virus. And he said that the the medieval way is the right way in this in this in the case of SARS-CoV-2, and he said this is because this reminds him of the Spanish flu. Now I don't know. Uh, he never gave any evidence for what the relationship between the you know, parallel between the Spanish flu, which was actually a version of H1N1, and SARS-CoV-2. He didn't prove. He just like he was winging it. Right. I think he just enjoyed being a big shot, uh, you know, being the uh, go-to pundit. He became very, very famous. He was on all the talk shows. He's got this authoritative sounding baritone voice. He's a very sort of scary guy. So he was the perfect sort of Orson Welles st- style of narrator, you know, of, of the scary pandemic. And, and um, next thing you know, in the blink of an eye, uh, we were locked down. I mean, it was, it was uh, just two weeks later. Right. When all the travel restrictions went into place, and and the Trump administration sent out guidelines to all the governors, recommending that they shut down the schools, close their businesses, shut down the movie theaters and arts, and and um, and and lock their hospitals to everyone except coronavirus patients, and divide workers between essential and unessential. That all came from the Trump administration. People don't realize that, but it's it's actually true. Yeah. Now. You mentioned about the, the, the research that's uh, ongoing, very much on research on uh, ongoing research to uh, try to evaluate the, how effective these non pharmaceutical mm-hmm. interventions or lockdowns have been. But uh, some people would point to the fact that seemingly China sur- uh, suppressed this virus with uh, non pharmaceutical inter- interventions. And you know somehow we were able to control the first SARS, SARS-1 and, and MERS, uh, both other respiratory ailments. Um, Without them spreading uh, across the world, so what do you think? Do you, do you think either of those examples are, are, are actually show that there's some ability to suppress it through these uh, a, a virus through these different uh, policies? No, and the the example that people point to now is New Zealand, actually, um, more than any other. But they keep having a lockdown. It's like a lockdown so that's so effective that they keep they keep they think they're just going to keep trying it again and again and again, <laughs> doing the same thing in Australia. As for China, it's not clear exactly what happened uh, there. Uh, Wuhan, they they were bolting people into their apartment complexes and dragging people right. here and there and wearing hazmat suits and that sort of thing. Um, uh, t- t- whether and to what extent that had any effect on the p- p- the path of the disease, certainly the Chinese government took uh, credit for that mm-hmm. and convinced the rest of the world that, that it worked beautifully. But it's not clear. I mean, we know for sure there have been other outbreaks of, of, this, of this virus uh, elsewhere in China, but, you know, other people speculate that China realized pretty early on, the Chinese doctors realized pretty early on that this was for most, most people, uh, it's either asymptomatic or it's a mild cold. And mm-hmm. But they had some beautiful footage of people falling down dead in the streets and you know locking people. So they, they sold a kind of uh, virus mitigation plan to the world that they actually didn't uh, practice themselves. I mean, China 
was Wuhan was open within like three or four weeks after this uh, uh, after this absurdity, um, whereas the rest of the world just went ahead and locked down. So Ch China's GDP grew uh, 8% uh, mm -hmm. in the in the second half of uh, 2020, while you know the rest of the world you know is in negative territory. So, you know. I mean, were we gaslighted? You know, I just don't, I don't entirely know. There's another factor to consider with uh, China. Um, and it has to do with the ge 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 geography of these diseases. So um, I don't think there's any question that people agree that SARS-CoV-1 exposure uh, in a community will provide some measure, even a strong degree of cross immunity protection for SARS-CoV-2. And we know that's certainly true for the common colds and other pathogens, that there are cross immunities. Uh, that is probably the best explanation for a situation like what you saw in Taiwan, where you had um, uh, no lockdowns. I mean, like none. People don't talk about that. They, were, they, didn't, they didn't do anything except screen people at the border. But otherwise, mm -hmm. everybody just went around their business. Mask wearing was very low, except to the extent the air got bad, you know, which is always true in these countries. And they had no stringencies whatsoever, no cancelization of schools or events or anything else. They had um, only uh, a handful of deaths. I mean, like I, under 100. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, very few cases, but also they had almost no testing. So, you know, I mean, it's like, it's hard to know exactly what happened in Taiwan, but basically there are neg negligible severe outcomes uh, at all. But that might be due to cross communities. In other words, there's a lot of factors that go into how a virus plays out in the community. Mm -hmm. Probably none of them have anything to do with politics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm not, so here's the thing. I, I don't think that staying perfectly open is going to protect you from a pathogen, but nor do I think that staying totally closed is going to protect you from a pathogen. It probably doesn't matter either way, but at least when, when the community is open, then, then people don't get demoralized. You have other goods and services uh, that are being exchanged. You don't have the good disruption of supply chains. The hospitals stay open so people can continue to get cancer screenings. Uh, people aren't driven to despair and suicide and all the rest of it. So openness is, is the best way to deal with a, a, a new pathogen because it allows you to use intelligence and it allows people to make their own judgments about the risk profile of various behaviors. Older people who want to stay indoors and avoid the Justin Bieber concert is probably a good idea, but younger people who want to go about their business go about spring break and so on. That's, that's fine too. Well, yeah, and I think, um, you know, I think certainly one of the things we've lost track of here is, is any kind of balance between uh, COVID and, and the other ailments of life because you know, we've certainly taken stuff that, as you mentioned, with cancer screenings are, are going to have a lot of uh, negative effects. And you know certainly uh, wealth helps us fight viruses and, uh, and other uh, things and, and a lot leads to better health uh, uh, as well. So. I just sort of, in, we have a few seconds, or a few moments left here, so if just in sort of wrapping up, is there anything you'd like to add here? Well, I think if, if for, for anybody who cares about uh, prosperity and, and preserving freedom and, and human rights, we need to read up on the relationship between the presence of pathogens in society and how we're gonna behave as a political community. Mm -hmm. This thing took everybody by shock, uh, by surprise, it should not have we all need to get smarter, uh, realize that, that, that pathogens will always be among us. We are right. going to face this again. Next time, I hope we deal with it with, with wisdom and prudence and using genuine public health uh, measures. Well, thank you so much for coming on and enjoy this conversation. And thanks for you, you all for joining us. Join us again next time for another e-conversations.